on page 89, that's where we're at, but I'm sure if you think about it, that you realize we've already dealt with it a couple of times, at least in passing. Um, I've mentioned it perhaps a couple of times myself, and then um, Jamal covered it pretty well. Um, you see on the top the, the conclusion of William Miller on why the daily is paganism, and then you have Second Thessalonians on your paper. You have uh, the Great Controversy, page 55, which says, In the 6th century, the papacy had become firmly established. Its seat of power was fixed in the imperial city, and the bishop of Rome was declared to be head over the entire church. Paganism had given place to the papacy. So... When, when people suggest that Sister Wright has no insight on the daily, um, she's here giving a specific comment of what the relationship of the daily and the abomination of desolation was all about. Paganism giving place to the papacy. Um, and we've, we've dealt with, with much of this. You know, one thing that I would remind myself, seeing in the Lord's providence, we've um, covered many, many of these things. Even this that I'm going to share up here, Jamal touched on lightly, but I'll remind us of it here again. <clears throat> if you remember, there was a point yesterday where Jamal did the pattern of Christ. And in the pattern of Christ, the first way Mark he marked was the, the time of preparation. And it was 30 years that Christ was in preparation. And then when he was baptized, he was in power and gave his testimony for three and a half years. And then was the cross, his death. And then the resurrection, the ascension, <coughs> then 80, 70, marking the destruction the seven last plague time period, and then AD 100, the second coming of Christ. And as he put the pattern of Christ up there, he also put the pattern of the Word of God in Revelation 11. And then he put the pattern of Antichrist, all right? I, there is no evidence that I'm aware of. I'm certain that... You're back. Welcome. I'm certain that uh, the pioneers didn't identify this pattern and so when you're talking about the subject of the daily and you're, you're lining up the pattern of Antichrist, the preparation time period that, where Sister Wright says paganism has given way, given place to the papacy, paganism is removed and by the way according to the pioneer understanding and it's placed on the throne of the earth in 538 and for three and a half years it gives its prophetic testimony until it receives a deadly wound, the point being, if and only if you maintain the pioneer understanding of the daily, that it is removed in 508, are you establishing that the preparation time for the Antichrist is 30 years, just as the preparation for Christ was 30 years? So 508, there's a defense for 508 and the pioneer understanding of paganism that was not recognized by the pioneers and those modern theologians that are trying to reject the pioneer position, they need to deal with this model as well because this model is, is illustrated in several places. Now, Jamal did not um, did not address some of the other issues with this, and I have time. You may not think that I have time, but I've glanced at these notes and. Uh, there's very little of this that we don't already have in the record. Okay, so um, let me let me do a little step a little bit outside of this. Put me in here. Hmm. 
I wish I had my, my notes. I think I do have them here, but I'm not turning to them. I'll tell I'll tell you this presentation. And uh, it would be better. If I can find these notes. Okay, I'm not finding notes. Let me just do it off the top of my head. And, and so let me reacquaint you with what I'm saying here. You know, we're still dealing with the daily, at least partially, but we're going to take the subject of the daily a little bit further. But when you recognize this aspect of the daily, the pioneer position even becomes more important and more sound. Okay, this is the pattern of Christ. Christ was born 30 years later. He's baptized. He's empowered. He gives his testimony for three and a half years. He dies. He's resurrected. He ascends. Okay. And then you have illustration of the seven last plague time period with the destruction of Jerusalem. You have the second coming of Christ when he comes to John and the Isle of Patmos. You have all those quotes in your notes. Not only does the Word of God in Revelation 11 follow this pattern as well, Jamal's already put in the record, but other histories follow this pattern. You can you can line up the history of Moses, the history of, of Adventism on this pattern, because the history of Moses, Moses is a type of Christ, this is the pattern of Christ, and Adventism is a type of Christ, 144,000 are going to perfectly reflect the character of Christ. You can show these other lines in there as well. But the Antichrist is also a type of Christ. This is the, the power that stands in the place of Christ. And one of the, the more in depth truth in the story of Christ is that when he came uh, and to confirm the covenant for one way, he was setting aside the old in order to bring in the new. He was setting aside the old covenant to bring in the new covenant. Um, there is a change of dispensation that is taking place in here. All right, And it's and the, the notes that I'm hunting for that I think they're here, but it's not popping into my head where I have them. When you mark the the different steps of the change of dispensation that happens here in the story of Christ, then you are identifying more specifically the work of Antichrist. Because there are three counterfeits. There are three counterfeits to the three dispensations that take place in Christian history. The first dispensation is the dispensation of the Father. Okay? And Jesus, uh, Jesus comes in order to, to mark the dispensation of the Son, and he's setting aside the first, um, the first dispensation to bring in the new dispensation, and then in Pentecost, um, he leaves in order to bring in the third dispensation, which is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. And our culture, Sister White says, we are now in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. So in the line of sacred history, there are three movements. One is identifying the Father, one is identifying the Son, and one is representing the Word of the Holy Spirit. Satan counterfeits all these movements. Okay, the first is paganism, is the counterfeit of the Old Testament. All right. So when you're lining up the pattern of Christ and you're noting that that the old dispensation is being set aside for the new in the history of Christ, the same thing is happening here with. Paganism being set aside in order to bring in the, the next dispensation of satanic counterfeit. All right, and in the history of Christ, the, the next dispensation, which is Pentecost, I'm going to put it up here as number four because we remember in our in the pattern we dealt with so often here, um, the cross was the number three, uh, the baptism was the number one. Pentecost here is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. So the change of dispensations here happens very quickly in here, but nevertheless, they're all three marked. Okay. When you when you understand this, you see that when Christ, you, you can this is the notes I don't have right in front of me. I'm just going to point you to them so you at least see this in this pattern. Why what, why did Christ say um, that he needed to go away? Okay, so when when you take those kind of points of truth out of the pattern of Christ, um, then you can bring those same lines of thought down here. The papacy needed to receive a deadly wound. 
in order that the third and final counterfeit dispensation would arrive in history. And what's the third counterfeit? Apostate Protestantism. Okay. Paganism is the first the first dispensation of satanic counterfeit, and paganism is what power of the dragon of these two false prophets? It's the dragon, okay? The first dispensation is set aside in this history, just like the first dispensation has been set aside in the history of Christ. And then you have the dispensation of the beast, for how long? 1260 years. And, but it was expedient that the papacy received its deadly wound in order that the third dispensation of the false prophet would arrive. Okay? So the notes that I have that are here somewhere, but I'm not going to take the time to get them out, draw these parallels about the first covenant, the second covenant, and these, these dispensations. I will take them out before they get done because when we get to Revelation 8, verse 1 through 6, it will be helpful to to have this in your mind for that point too. So there are in in this history that is marked by the pioneers, even though they didn't recognize it, they didn't deal with this, they didn't dwell on this. We're seeing paganism being set aside for papalism, and this is a counterfeit of the setting aside of the, the first covenant for the second covenant, as is identified in the book of Hebrews. But so is the work of bringing the Holy Spirit in, it's being counterfeited here in the work of the, um, the United States being identified as a false prophet. This is 1798, correct? And this line of prophecy, 1798, this three and a half years parallels the three and a half years of the drought of Elijah, right? So Elijah returns in here in order to bring the test of Carmel, correct? If we're, if we're considering this as a type of Elijah, this is the three and a half years of drought. This is really the three and a half years of papal rule. Am I losing you? I'm, I'm, going, I'm going a little bit further than you thought I would go, no doubt about it. Pardon me? Um, we're going to go forward. I want to show you something. This, th this is the, the pattern of Antichrist. It runs parallel to the pattern of Christ. All the way marks are parallel. And you'll follow me on that. Okay. As we shared the pattern of Christ before, we did not mention at all that within the pattern of Christ is illustrated the change of these dispensations from the Father to the Son to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Um, and because we didn't do that, and you weren't prepared for me to, to point out that in the pattern of Antichrist, you also see the change of dispensations between the three counterfeits, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Okay? <coughs> They're there. All right? I want to add one other thought with that so you can perhaps see what I'm speaking about. This period here, this 1260 years, is represented as Thyatira in Revelation chapter four, three, right? Two, chapter two. <clears throat> the symbol of, of the Thyatiran church is Jezebel. This is the papacy during this time period. Everyone understand? Yeah, this is this is com this is typical common. It's not common anymore, but it should be standard Adventist understanding. We should all understand what Thyatira. The Thyatira, the 1260 years of papal rule, is also a type of the three and a half years of darkness in the time period of Elijah. Okay, and after the drought, Elijah comes to Ahab and he says, we're going to have a meeting at Carmen, right? Okay, so after 1798, the Lord raises up William Miller and Sister White compares William Miller with who? Elijah. Elijah. Okay, so in one sense, the, the Millerite movement is paralleling Carmel. Right? There, and we've, we've talked about this a little bit before. So this history from 1798 is the history from the end of the drought in Carmel. And we have William Miller here representing Elijah that brings the reform message. He brings the first angel's message, paralleling Elijah's message of choose this day whom you will serve. Right? The Protestant churches reject William Miller's message. Just as 
the prophets of Baal do their dance of deception all day long first. First you see the activities of the enemies, correct? Okay? And then we see a manifestation of the power of God. The manifestation of the power of God in the history of the Millerites is the midnight cry. Right? The manifestation of the power of God in the story of Elijah is the fire coming out of heaven. And when the fire comes down out of heaven, when the midnight cry takes place, the second midnight cry, when it takes place, what happens is the true prophet is identified. And who's the true prophet? It's Adventism. It's the 50 Millerites that move into the most holy place. They are glorified in that time. They're marked as the true prophet. They're, they're marked as Elijah. All right? And, and if you read Dan Steed's book, if you read Dan Steed's book, he will tell you that when the Millerites, after October 22nd, 1844, when they begin to look into the Bible to determine what had happened and who they were, the first thing that they came to in the Bible that they, they recognized, identified who they were, was Elijah. That was the first thing they came to understand, is that they were a type of Elijah. But at the same time that the true prophet Elijah has been illustrated in this history, the false prophet has been identified. And who's the false prophet? It's apostate Protestants. Okay, so what I'm saying is, the first counterfeit dispensation was the dragon. It was paganism. And in 508, it was taken away in order to put 30 years of preparation in to place the second counterfeit dispensation, the beast, the Antichrist. In the beast, the dragon is counterfeiting the father. Who's the pope counterfeit? The son. The false prophet is counterfeiting the work that's accomplished up here by the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Okay, we have that in the record. That, that brothers and sisters, there's much more to say about that, and I wish I had my notes in front of me where I could where I could show you the verses where, um, for instance, I'll give you the type of verses that I have that aren't on the forefront of my, my mind. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen and in the beast, the cat, the beast of Catholicism in Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2, the composite beast, it's the same beast, essentially, as the beast of Daniel 7 and the beast of Daniel 12. It's a, yeah, it's the, it's the, if you've seen the beast of Catholicism, you've seen the beast of paganism. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. All the way through, if you look closely in the Scriptures, these same truths about Christ and the Father and Christ and His work are illustrated in the, the counterfeit Antichrist. Um, do, you, do you really believe that the Pope actually acknowledge that they actually understand and believe that they're actually doing that? That they're actually doing what? They're not fulfilling that role. No. No, uh, uh, this is God's, God's controlling this by his prophets. They're not, um, they're deceived. They're the what? They're deceived. They're deceived. Okay, they said they were deceived. And then how do you put a statement that actually no one who they're worshiping is a fulfillment of what they're trying to achieve? They know that they're You're talking about, um, well, even you're talking about them fulfilling certain actions in their own experience. We're talking about the panorama of the great controversy that's that's beyond any human being. Why don't you take the time to find your notes? Um, well, because I, I have one other point on here that I want to fill in and get us done, and we'll be on time. I, the reason that I wanted to go there, I'll tell you the reason that I wanted to go there in that is, and it's number one, to give just a little bit more information on the daily to say that the pioneer position of the daily is even bigger than some people realize. But the other is, is that when we get into the opening of the seventh seal, in Revelation 8, verses 1 through 6, what's being portrayed there is Christ's intercessory work. And in his intercessory work, there is more than one thing happening at the same time. And in order to, to see it fully, you need to understand that Christ is not only dealing with blotting out the sins of the 144,000 and the closing scenes of the 144,000 
but he's also in control of all the events in the world, and he's in control of all the nations of the world, and he's governing these things. I mean, that's that when when Brother DeWayne was pointing out today that um, the throne room scene of Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel and John are the same scene, well, those wheels within wheels in the story of Ezekiel, those are emphasizing God's um, work in controlling the ebb and flow of history and nations, and that is accomplished uh, in his intercessory work as portrayed in Revelation 8, verses 1 through 6. And part of what is accomplished in the time period of dealing with 144,000 is the, the governing of these final events of not only the sacred part of the history, but the satanic part of the history. So let, let's go back to our notes on page 89. On page, page 90, we've already um, looked at the, the talked about more than once. But in early writings, page 259, when the, the Jews were left in perfect darkness because they plunked the progressive test that began with John the Baptist, that the next paragraph talks about the Millerites that end up praying with Satan, and we compared that with the strong delusion that takes place among Adventists in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. And we're saying contextually, um, in chapter 2, the love that, or the truth that is not loved by Adventists um, is the relationship of paganism and papalism, and more specifically, it has to do with the daily. It's, it's also the general disregard for truth. But it's in that passage, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Miller discovered what the daily was. Part of the problem we have with the Lord today is because it was this translation of the uh, Hebrew the, the, the word. If they use different words than they you could have had all this one. Perhaps, but, but like in this, the Latin Bible, it's continual. And it's <coughs> continual in the Hebrew. So I mean, pardon me? Or permanent. Or what? Permanent. Permanent? I have never translated that way. After continual is the, what most people usually suggest is the best translation. So I'm gonna, I'll add one more thing on the thought of continual. I'm not sure the point you're making on permanent. I don't know how to. But you said it was a noun. And then it was a noun. Right. That's right. Continual is a noun. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's the awkwardness of it. But even even with continual, okay, Sister White says that we we need to learn we need to learn to trace the workings of of the powers that are involved with the great controversy through history and prophecy. And at the end of the world, there are three powers that oppose God and His people: the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And the dragon begins its story at the Tower of Babel. All right, this is the Tower of Babel. And it goes through history. But there comes a point in time when the second power that's going to oppose God and its people comes into history. And it's in the 508 to 538 time period. This power descends but continues. And this power takes the ascendancy. All right, this is the dragon. This is the beast, the papal power. But in 1798, this power receives a deadly wound. This power continues on. The dragon power continues on. And this power continues on too, even though the deadly wound isn't healed yet. But in 1776, the power that's destined to be the false prophet comes into history. And they, they come together at the end of the world into the threefold union. Okay. So there's three powers, the, bee, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. So when Daniel uses the word to me, which means continual, continual, he's using the perfect word, because of these three powers that oppose God and his people, the one of those three powers that has continually opposed God and his people throughout history is paganism. 
the dragon power. Yeah. Now, in terms of, of the fact that continual, the word continual, can't be a noun because it's continual, um, what you need to remember there is that Daniel chapter 2 teaches the kingdoms of Bible prophecy in a general sense. Daniel chapter 7 repeats the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, but it's identifying their political manifestation. These are the beasts. Okay? Daniel chapter 7 is talking about the political manifestations of the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. And Daniel chapter 8, speaking of the same kingdoms of Bible prophecy, is talking about the religious manifestation of the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. And Bible prophecy is about the combination of church and state. So this is consistent with God's prophetic word, that when he deals with the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, he's telling us about their political side and their religious side. Okay, so when it comes to Daniel chapter 8, when Daniel is going to describe his kingdoms of Bible prophecy, he uses terms from God's sanctuary. Okay? He wants us to understand that this is the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, but this is their religious manifestation. And therefore, we find several words in Daniel chapter 8 that are drawn from the sanctuary service in the Bible, but they're all corrupted. Okay? When they're used, they're corrupt. Um, what's the, one of the kingdoms in Daniel chapter 8 is the ram, is it not? And how many horns does the ram have? And are the horns perfect? No, they're not perfect. Was the ram a sanctuary offering? Yes. But if it was going to be an offering, did the horns have to be perfect? Yes. Okay, what about the goat? Is it a sanctuary offering? No. Yes. But was it horn, was its horns perfect? No. Okay, they're broken. So it should go through not only the ram and the goat, but the terms from the sanctuary that are used by Daniel to describe the religious manifestation of these kingdoms of Bible prophecy they're a little bit twisted to make sure that you understand that this is a counterfeit religion, it's an impure or a corrupt religion. So, yeah, it may be hard to define continual as a noun because it's continual, continual all, but it's the one word in the Bible that Sister White makes sure that we understand as a noun and says that the word sacrifice is had supplied by human wisdom and does not belong to the text. And it fits with Daniel using this word um, that is employed in the sanctuary in, in a twisted way, so to speak. He's, he's making sure that we understand that this is a corrupt, corrupt religion. And I, I'm, if you feel a little bit um, frustrated that in this presentation I'm not keeping to the notes and we're just going random, I apologize, but I'm satisfied because what we're dealing with here is trying to put some points in place to defend this part of the foundations of Adventism, the daily. And given time, these subjects that we're addressing, I would put out there. And as I look at these notes, we've covered most of them. But I have one more that we haven't covered that I want to put in place. So um, let's move on. The, I was talking to a brother here immediately before lunch. And uh, I forget how we got to this point. But I told them that uh, there is, it had to do with the judgment beginning with the house of God, and that as a corporate body, Seventh-day Adventists are the first to be fully devoid of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because we're judged first, and those of us that are alive and receive the mark of the beast, the Holy Spirit's totally removed from us. So as a corporate body, those Seventh-day Adventists that receive the mark of the beast, they're the first group of people that are totally void of the Holy Spirit. And I told them there's a quote for that, and it's on the bottom of page 9. I put it in there in connection with the strong delusion. And we, when we were discussing this, um, he pointed to a quote that we're familiar with where Sister White talks about when Satan is personating Christ, that the, the counterfeit will be of a... a of almost over mastering power, how would she say? Not over, it may be overwhelming, but the one where it's over mastering power, okay? When Satan is here doing his counterfeit, the temptation that's going to be brought in that time period is just almost beyond any ability to stand, but even with the strength of Christ. And I pointed out to him that. That before that time, Adventism has already flunked or passed the test. That, that work of deception that's taking place takes place after the Sunday law. 
the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy, and this is on the 2004 Prophecy School if you want to check it out, the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy clearly identify that Satan personates Christ after the Sunday law in the United States, and Sister White says he's allowed to continue his deceptions until probation closes. <clears throat> All right. From the Sunday law in the United States until human probation closes, Satan is there personating Christ, and during this time period, when the eleventh hour workers are being called out to stand with God's people, this is when he's doing those deceptions. Seventh day Adventists have already closed the door because the door closes for them at the Sunday law, and when the door closes for them, they receive strong delusion because they would not receive the love of the truth. All right. And in this quote, here's another line of, of argument along this line. It's from the bottom of page 90, Selected Messages, Book 3, page 155. A new heart will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I believe with all my heart that the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from the world, and those who have had great light and opportunities and have not improved them, and in the spirit of prophecy, who is it? that has had great life and opportunities. Seventh-day Adventists. So she's saying, those Seventh-day Adventists that have had great light and opportunities but have not improved them will be the first to be left. They have breathed away the Spirit of God. The present activity of Satan in working upon hearts and upon churches and nations should startle every student of prophecy. The end is near. You know, the, since I've been here, and, I, and I'm not criticizing, I know the person that told me this story is in this room, I'm not criticizing this person for this story at all, but I want to tell this story, okay? He, he wanted me to look at something, and he told me that he got this information from a brother that's from Jamaica, and I happen to have, no, I know this brother from Jamaica, and this brother from Jamaica and I were two of several speakers at a camp meeting at the beginning of last year, and, uh, he was teaching prophecy, and I was teaching prophecy, and from my opinion, he was teaching some of the darkest, foolishest prof prophetic understandings that I'd ever heard, and so much so that after his first presentation, I went to the brother that invited me and said, I'm sorry, I know that we have handouts prepared, and I have so many presentations, and I, and I, I need to get through them for you, but I can't go up there and speak without responding to this guy. He says, go ahead and respond. So it was bad. But you're not supposed to do that, but I couldn't be in that. And I told him, or you can just let me go home. I'll go home rather than the cause this. I gave him that opportunity. He said, no, stay. So we did dueling prophecy for a couple of days, all right? And there came a point where he, he gave up, all right? He'd get up there, and then I would share why I thought he was wrong, and he'd come up again, and I'd share why he was wrong, and Frank gave up, and he went home. But before he went home, he had a sermon where I had this chart and this chart hanging on the wall. It was that chart there, the 1843 chart, and he's from Jamaica, the zeal of the Jamaican. And he's standing up there saying, If the Lord was in this chart, then I want nothing to do with this truth. And he went on and on and on, attacking that chart to where, you know, you're thinking he wanted to be out of the sanctuary. He's you know, he's about ready to call down the wrath of God, the way he's treating his chart. You know, the Lord's going to have to judge him because the Lord knows the light that he had. I'm not, I'm not passing that kind of judgment on it, but that's <coughs> what she says. They grieved away the Spirit of God, the present activity of Satan in working upon hearts and upon churches and nations should start with every student of prophecy. When we start understanding this message and we start seeing the attacks that are coming upon this message, Brothers and sisters, this should startle us for a Seventh-day Adventist to have the courage to to attack that chart when they know that Sister White says that this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. That's pretty good evidence that the Holy Spirit isn't really guiding their thought process. Even if they were to think it in their heart to stand in front of a congregation and realize that. It's just amazing. And brothers and sisters, this kind of things are happening in Adventism today. I think that we're talking about the Lord is just the Christ in the church and the Lord is the Lord in the church and the Lord in the church and the Lord in the Old Testament that is the entire professor. And we have to treat them that we never get to the point that we have to be perfect on earth. 
And you just need another friend who was that up and they could be challenged for that belief. And then the other guy that was teaching me, and I said, you know, I said, well, I don't even know why. I said, I don't even know if I can tell myself it's going to be a friend that I am here. And this was some of the guys that I could say they're teaching me to people, and nobody would say anything. Let's finish, let's finish this book. I won't finish the paragraph, but notice the next paragraph, because this goes along with what she was saying. This goody-goody religion that makes light of sin, and it is forever dwelling upon the love of God to the sinner, encourages the sinner to believe that God will save him while he continues in sin and knows it to be sin. This is the way that many are doing who profess to believe the present truth. The truth is kept apart from their life, that it is... The re- that is, and that is the reason it has no more power to convict and convert the soul. There must be a straining of every nerve and and spirit and muscle to lead the world, its customs, its practices, and its fashions. And the brothers and sisters, we're not strained in Adventism. Um, next, next quote: Revelation. 18.4 The Bible declares that before the coming of the Lord, Satan will work with all powers and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, and that they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And they that receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved will be left to receive strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Not until this condition shall be reached and the union of the church with the world shall be fully accomplished throughout Christendom will the fall of Babylon be complete. The change is a progressive one, and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14.8 is yet future. Notwithstanding the spiritual darkness and alienation from God that exists in the churches which constitute Babylon, the great body of Christ's true followers are still to be found in her, their communion. There are many who have never seen the special truths for this time. So not a few are dissatisfied with their present condition and are longing for clearer life. They look in vain for the image of Christ in the churches which they are connected. As these bodies depart further and further from the truth and all ally themselves more closely with the world, the difference between the two classes will widen and will finally result in separation. The time will come when those who love God supremely can no longer remain in the connection with such as lovers of pleasure nor <coughs> lovers of God, had it been a former form of godliness, but not denying the power thereof. Pardon me? Okay. But the, I'm sorry. But denying the power thereof. Revelation 18 points to the time when, as the result of rejecting the threefold warning of Revelation 14, 6 through 12, the church will have fully reached the condition foretold by the second angel. And the people of God still in battle will be called upon to separate from the communion. This message is the last that will ever be given to the world and will accomplish its work. When those that believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness shall be left to receive strong delusion and to believe a lie, then the light of truth will shine upon all whose hearts are open to receive it. And all the children of the Lord that remain in Babylon will heed the call from out of their my people. And the point that I would like you to see in there is that when we're suggesting that the wrong understanding of the daily is what the cure is evidence to receive the strong delusion. This strong delusion is demonstrated and delivered to them at the Sunday law. The Sunday law where this action takes place is the Sunday law where the wheat is separated from the tear. This is, this is dealing with Revelation 18. In Gospel Workers 3 before it says, John says, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power on the earth as light with his glory. Then, as at the Pentecostal season, the people will hear the truth spoken to them, every man in his own tongue. God can bring new life into every soul that sincerely desires to serve him, and can touch the lips with the coal from off the altar, and cause them to become eloquent with his praise. Thousands of voices will be imbued with the power to speak forth the wonderful truth of God's word. The stammering tongue will be loosed and the timid will be made strong to their courageous testimony to the truth. May the Lord help his people to cleanse his soul from every defilement and maintain so close a connection with him that they may be partakers of the latter rain when it shall be poured out. Amen. 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 And when it's poured out, the Lord is going to speak to his people through the stammering tongue, according to this passage in Isaiah 28. Um,
We've read about the scornful men. We've talked about the scornful men that ruled Jerusalem. And we've read um, this quote from Dalai letters. Um, and you'll see some other quotes dealing with Isaiah 28. Let's leave it there. What we're, what we're suggesting is this. Is that when the Lord unseals the seven thunders to his to the 144,000 at the end of time. That, the truth of the seven thunders is that the Millerite history is repeated and he will lead them back to the foundations of Adventism. We are saying that the, the way that this was accomplished by the Lord is partially, in a great way, the 2520. And the 2520 got drawn into the, to the truths that were being studied. Uh, men and women were led back more fully to this chart, and this chart became a focus of attention for those people that are following the increasing light in Adventism. Um, if you are among those that are following the increasing light, then you need to come to grips with this chart. And, I, and there's two people, maybe more here, two people that says, you know what, you, and they've said it more than once. This brother back here, what's your name? Greg. Brother Greg's brought this up, uh, Brother Dave's brought it up, maybe others. You need to just have a presentation where you just go through and you nail down every one of the items on this chart. So, so we're we're sensing we're sensing the the a good a good thought. We need to understand this chart. The Lord is taking us back to this chart. We we have friends in Arkansas, husband and wife, and what they've been doing for about six weeks is the husband takes this chart and he pulls it like this, or you can see it. And then his wife stands before him, and his wife asks her questions about this chart. He has to answer them. And they did that for about 15 minutes, and then they reverse it. And he gets to ask her questions about this chart. And they were telling me that they're being so greatly blessed from, from adding that to their worship that they can't believe it. So, so my response to him, I says, well, you need to add this chart to it. So I, I, I haven't spoken to them since we left, but I think that's what they're doing. The Lord is drawn by his people back to this chart. This is the foundations. And if you remember the quotes where she was dealing about, we have no new message, and she spoke about the message of 1840 and 44, there was two of those quotes that she directly tied in with the loud cry message. These foundational truths are what the final warning message, the third angel's message, the loud cry message, the latter angel's message, the fourth angel's message, are built upon the truths of this chart. So what we've been doing here, we're bringing this pretty much to a close here. There's many truths on here. We weren't we weren't dealing with the 1335 and the 1290. We were just identifying a little bit of the arguments concerning the daily. Um, and we identified nine places where Sister White endorses the pioneer position of the trumpets. We need to do this because we still have stuff to teach about the trumpets, the seventh trumpet. And we dealt with the 2520, and, and at the same time, explained how having the wrong understanding of 508 and the daily destroys the foundations of Adventism in 2300 days. The fact that the General Conference at this time has actually put in writing that they reject the, the trumpets and the 2520, and although I don't know that they put in writing that they reject the daily, they certainly teach it should startle every student of prophecy to use Sister White's words. Okay? We've been warned that there was going to be an attack upon the foundations. In fact, when it comes to the king of the cards, and I'll close with this a little bit later on. I got what? Oh, then I won't close with this, but I'll tell you about the king of the north. The king of the north is one of the arguments that have taken place in Adventism. And it, the king of the north is the papacy, and it was understood to be the papacy until the heyday of Uriah Smith. And the very first time that Uriah Smith preached that the king of the north was Turkey was at a very large uh, Adventist meeting, and for many years I said it was at the Dime Tabernacle. I think I'm incorrect on that, but it was still at a large Adventist gathering. Um, so I stand corrected for the many times I've said that. But he preached a sermon identifying the king of the north as Turkey. And as soon as he was done, James White walked up on the pulpit unplanned for him, and gave a sermon on why the king of the north is the Pope of Rome. And shortly thereafter, Sister White uh, rebuked James White, not because he was wrong, but because she didn't think he should have been so public in his disagreement for Uriah Smith. 
And that started an argument over the scene of the North for about a decade that went on between the Review and Herald and the Signs and the Times, between Urias and the King James White over the King of the North. Many Adventists of the day don't even know that argument existed, uh, but it did exist. It, it went on. And when you look closely, I have a point to go into there, when you look closely at the motivation for James White doing that, his motivation was based upon the fact um, I'm sure you're all aware of it, but Sister White did not have a problem with having her her works edited. She she had women that helped her with her editorial work, and they would take her work and they would correct it and they'd give it back to her, and she would put her signature on it saying she approved this, so she, she had editorial work, but before the time that she had editorial help from these sisters, who was it that did her editorial work? James White. So James White knew Ellen White's messages as well as anyone. And the motivation for James White to go up and oppose Uriah Smith was the fact that James White knew full well that we had dreams and vision given to us as a people, warnings that the foundations were going to come under attack. And he seen someone go up, and even someone in the stature of Uriah Smith, and attack what he thought were the foundations were. He could not hold himself back. Okay? So we have been warned that the foundations of Adventism would come under attack. And here we are at the end of the world. And we don't even know what the foundations of Adventism are any longer. It's, uh, these type of situations should start at every student of prophecy. But praise the Lord. And in a little gathering like this, and little gatherings like this that are going on all over the world now, and I can say that it may not be exactly, I know men in every continent outside of Iceland, men and women now, that understand and teach this message. And this going back to the foundations is happening all over Adventism. We praise the Lord that for whatever reason, He's allowed you and I to participate in coming to grips with these truths. Amen. And these truths are the truths that allow us to illustrate and understand what takes place at the end of the world. One of the arguments against the prophetic message that you often hear in Adventism is, you know, I once had a, once to speak in some Canada, and the, I had been invited to, to two churches. And the one church called says, you can't come up here. They tell me if you come up in my church, they're going to fire me. And the pastor called me that. And the pastor wasn't coming. He was at the meetings the whole week long. And he's a nice guy, but I realized when he was gone, he was just, he was at the spot. Because as soon, as soon as we left, and he started having sermons, and one of his sermons about that, he was, one of his statements in one of his sermons, is Jeff Pickinger was a lot about the man of God, but he doesn't know anything about Jesus Christ. And that's a common criticism of presenting the prophecies. You present the prophecies and people will think, well, where is Jesus Christ in, in all of this um, information? And brothers and sisters, Brother Jamal read a quote where, he, where Sister White plainly says what the foundations were. Now, we were, we've been looking at the foundations of many generations over and over. And what is the foundation? It's the rock of Christ. And in every one of those reform movements, the foundations have to be laid. And in the reform movement of the 144,000, the foundation, the foundational work that has to be laid by the 144,000 is that they have to wake up out of their land of sea and condition and return to the old past, return to the foundations, and come to understand what they are. So as you put out this prophetic message and you're talking about these truths and these prophetic timelines and you're not seeing Jesus Christ in it, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is the foundation. As we return to these truths, this is the rock of ages. He is the beginning and the end. He is the beginning and the end. And I was going down that line. Good for you. In the book of Revelation, to go ahead, Sister. I'll have a well, I, I contend that if you understand who the continual is, it's the devil himself and this, the big lie, and Jesus is the one fighting it, and we're the ones in the middle deciding whose side we're going to be on. 
very plain. Yeah. The, when you understand the continual is, I agree. It, the, the power that has continually opposed uh, Christ and his people throughout time, it, it, you don't have to just mark him here at the Tower of Babel. You can go all the way to the courts of heaven. It's, it's the driving power is the continual. It's paganism and self-exaltation. All the way to the tree in the garden. So one closing thought that Brother Gray, Gray brought up. Um, in Revelation chapter 1, which is the introductory chapter to Revelation, it's the key to to understand the rest of the book. The characteristic that Christ identifies of himself more than any other is that he's the first and the last, the alpha and the beginning, the beginning and the end. So those those that hear this prophetic message and they don't see Christ in it, you know, they, they might hear you talking about the seven churches and the histories involved with the seven churches, and as you're looking at those histories, they forget. That we're told that it was Christ that was walking through those candlesticks, and that those candlesticks represent the seven churches, and they forget that the 144,000 are those that follow Christ whithersoever he goes, even if he goes to this candlestick or this candlestick. Amen. And that's what we're supposed to be doing, is walking through those candlesticks with Christ, understanding that history. And the re- one of the reasons for it is through this process of understanding this increase of knowledge, Christ is going to accomplish the work of creating his character in us. And one one aspect of his character that he deals with more than any other in Revelation chapter 1 is his ability to illustrate the end from the beginning. And if you and I are going to be among the 144,000, then we're going to have to have the character of Christ, which means that we're going to understand the end of the world from the beginning of the world. And that's what this prophetic message is doing. It's providing us with an illustration of the end of the world, where we do understand the end from the beginning. But that is only received, that part of character development is only received by students of prophecy that stay on top of the unfolding light that he's been bringing to his people since he began to open up the seven letters. Heavenly Father, we wish to be among those people that are identified by Daniel as the wise. And we wish to be provided with information that we can pull some of our brothers and sisters out of the fire that aren't understanding these things correctly for wrong reasons fighting against this message. So we ask that you not only provide us with this information and the experience that corresponds to it, but provide us with the wisdom and discernment to know how to give the word in due season to stimulate sanctified curiosity in our brothers and sisters who are so sleeping so soundly at this time. We wish to be a tool in your hand to awaken. We also wish to finish the work of character development that when those outside of Adventism as well as those within the Adventists, that they see you, that they are drawn to you, drawn to the foot of the cross, in time to make preparation for the post probation which is coming. As such quite says, is an overwhelming surprise. It's easy to see that, that you are finishing your work now in the most holy place. And we've been told that the final movements are rapid and <coughs> the work that you began in each of us we do uh, in the speed that we can do in the hardest time. You bring us to maturity rapidly and we can finish this work and go home with you soon and ask in Jesus. Thank you.